Yeah. I'm not going to test on something that I didn't teach. Yeah, it's all good. Don't worry. Okay. Item number one for today, the midterm. So it's at 7 p.m. in this classroom. For those of you that have Cal accommodations need to book through Cal. Congratulations. You get to write it earlier than everybody else is going to be writing it in this room. Why? Because Cal closes at eight. <laughs> you guys, this goes from seven to nine. Cool. They'll just adjust your time for you. It's cool. It's not an issue. Um, it's based on the weekly lecture materials from weeks one to six, but technically we're not covering anything new next week. So it's really weeks one to five. Um, there is no hybrids. Uh, apparently this semester, the person who wrote the midterm decided to uh, not include hybrids. Congrats. It's one less thing to worry about. Um, the test is in two parts. There's going to be some multiple choice questions that's going to be done on Scantron. I'll be showing you guys how to fill out a Scantron sheet properly next week in case you have never done it before. Because every semester somebody fucks it up. So I now actually spend five minutes showing you guys how to fill in a Scantron sheet. Part two is a short answer. Ignore the word essay. I don't want an essay. Um, and there's question paper itself. There's a spot for you to answer on it. So part one, 35 multiple choice questions. Originally it was supposed to be 45. If anybody actually read this announcement when I first posted it, it said 45. And then I got the draft of the, I got the final draft, of the midterm and it's 35. So 35 multiple choice questions. And there's two short, we are calling them essay questions, but the way it works is there's actually four. You pick two. So you pick the two you think you can answer well, and you do it. So there's two short answer type things where it's asking you uh, to describe something. There's one that's going to be a normalization exercise, like what I'm going to be doing today and next week. And a diagram. So you have a choice. You can do a dry diagram. You can do some normalization. You can do some, a couple short answers. You pick. So total 37 questions. All said and done. It is uh, basically 80 minutes. I don't know why they insist on writing 75 minutes plus five minutes of grace period. I don't know what the heck that's supposed to mean. You get 80 minutes. I'll be putting up a time for 80 minutes. When 80 minutes runs out, 80 minutes runs out. Realistically, what that five minute grace period is, is for people coming in late. So if they come in late, they get up to five minutes where they're not going to actually lose any extra time. Um, you need to bring an HP pencil. And a good eraser. So those are normal, you know, normal pencils. The ones that do nice, solid, dark marks is what you want. Uh, I say a good eraser uh, because Scantron is picky as picky can be. And if you need to, you may have to redo your Scantron sheet, which is okay. Because if you can't erase it, so, you know, yeah. Why is it not on Brightspace, you mean? You're welcome to book a meeting with the chair and have a discussion with her while we're not allowed to do our tests online. I'm being sarcastic. She's going to say no. She decided three semesters ago that all major evaluations are on paper. Because if you're on your computer, not everybody's computers handle that special lockout browser properly. And there's ways to get around it. So then people just whip open chat GPT next to the thing and they start asking chat GPT, chat GPT to answer the questions for them. So you can thank chat GPT for getting rid of electronic tests. I liked electronic tests because I didn't have to wait for the results from the test center. It's cool. It's life, dude. Suck it up. Sure, but it is what it is. 
It's closed book, no notes, no laptops, no phones. The only thing that's going to be on the desk in front of you is your pencils, your erasers, maybe a pen. If you want to like ha write with a pen for your long, the long answers, um, an eraser and something to drink. Everything else will be under your desk. I'm not going to make you guys pile of shit up front. It's going to be under the desk. I don't want to see any electronics and smartwatches. There are no, no. I'm positive. Yeah, exactly. I had somebody who kept going like this during a test because they'd figure they'd put in a gesture. They, they flicked their wrist twice. It would skip to the next. They had all the slides on their phone that they're watching. They were just going like this. So they're flicking through the slides on their. I'm like, whatever. Okay. So that's the situation with the midterm test. It's on paper. It's in this room, unless you're in Cal. Make sure you book with Cal because you will not get your extra time if you sit in this room. As it's going to be too hard for me to keep track of those that have 25%, 50%, 100%, and there's actually the 125% more time. I cannot keep track of individual people like that. So if you come to the room, you're getting the same time as everybody else. Realistically, 35 multiple choice questions and two short answers in 75 minutes is really lots of time. The university standard in Canada for multiple choice is 30 seconds per question. The college standard in Ontario is 45 seconds per question. If Even if I go one minute per question, that's 35 minutes, just multiple choice. And you still have another over half an hour for two other questions. It's, you guys get an insane amount of time. All right. So that's the stuff about midterm. Next one is MySQL Workbench. Real quick. So when you launch MySQL Workbench, it looks like this. Most of you have probably seen this screen by now. To diagram, you're going to go to the left. You'll notice where my mouse is with this thing just started lighting up. You click on that. You add the plus for a new model. And you're going to double click on add diagram. And it, you suddenly get a diagramming window. On this window, there's a few different tools you're going to use. There's the one for tables. One table, two tables, three tables. You click on the data thing, you put it over on the side. I am going to modify one of my tables and add a primary key. So I double clicked on it. The, if you double click in here, the very first time you add the very first field, it will automatically mark it as a primary key for you. You can name it whatever you want. That's up to you. Um, you give the, the thing a name here. You can change the data type here. And I'm gonna add another column here called discount. And I'm gonna make this a I've had, ex my experience with MySQL Workbench has been it works way better when you type the entire data type yourself instead of picking it from the list. MySQL Workbench is special. Not a good special. Um, how many of you use multiple monitors at home? <laughs> That's for shits and giggles. Launch MySQL Workbench, open up a diagram, drag it to another monitor. Get back to me. I know on my on my my de my desktop at home, you know, RTX 3060 Ti, 32 gigs of RAM, i9, it hangs. I don't know if it's my video card that does it, but I've had other people say it does the same thing on their machines. So my school workbench does not like. So just say oh, I'm not even going to do that. I'm going to start it on the other window and then add a diagram. It'll hang. The diagramming tool hangs on secondary displays. Why? I don't know. Unless you're on a Mac, maybe you'll get away with it. I have no idea. But it's weird on Mac anyways. It does different weird things. Okay, so the other tool you will need is your uh, relationship tools. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to add another, a primary key to my table three. They're good enough. I don't want to add any other stuff here. Relationship tools. We have our one-to-many, one non-identifying, one-to-many identifying, one-to-one and many-to-many. -many. Now, 
the way it works is you pick the relationship type you want to use. You click on the child table. You click on the parent table. It'll draw the relationship for you automatically. And it will also add the foreign key for you with the proper data type. Because that's a mistake people often do is they use the wrong data types when they're creating foreign keys. If you've created a, the relationship and it, and it is going in the right direction, but you realize you did something wrong, like you picked instead of identifying, you did non-identifying or whatever, you can edit it by double clicking on it. And it'll come up with this. And if you click on foreign key, you have the option to change it into a um, identifying. And you'll notice right here, see the little diamond right here? It shows it's a foreign key. When I make it identifying, it turns it into a key because now it's part of the primary key. Cool. And you can also do the mandatory, not mandatory. And this was something that I had students complain about several times ago. I'm clicking the mandatory thing and nothing's happening. And this is where it just shows how well written the software is. I haven't noticed that sarcasm. I'm going to turn that off and you'll notice nothing changed. I'm going to go click on my diagram. Whoop. It changes after you click on the diagram. But hey, I can change it from identifying to not identifying and it changes right away. Like the behavior is not consistent across what the different options do. Okay. So that is literally 90% of what you need for the lab and for the assignment. The only other thing that MySQL Workbench does one thing really well. Okay, well. I'm being generous when I said really, is the many-to-many -many tool. It, it will create the intersection table for you automatically. That's actually a good thing because other diagramming tools will not do it. And you have to do an extra step to convert it to an intersection table. This does it for you because technically there's no such thing as many-to-many -many in a physical diagram. It does it for you. That is literally everything you guys need for your assignment for this. Um, there's not much else to it than that. Uh, the last item is under file, export, export as PNG. That will export your diagram as a image. It is important that you do it that way and you don't do a screenshot because depending on your display aspect ratio and what resolution your laptop or your computer runs at, if you take a screenshot, it'll come to me either like super big or super tiny. So when you do export as PNG, I go da 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 da, save. I'm going to close Workbench. Don't save. Go to my desktop. And it'll give me a nice diagram like that, which I can now easily zoom in and out of and still be able to read it. That was literally all the bits and pieces you needed for Workbench. Okay, now that's out of the way, we're going to jump into today's meat and potatoes. This usually takes roughly an hour. Don't panic if you don't get it today. I'll be doing another example. I'll be doing an example at the end of today, and I'll be doing another example next week. Historically, I've done two examples back to back, and Literally, the next class students would come and go, I didn't get that second example, because by then their brains had melted, and there's no more information going in. So I'll go through the slides first, then I'll do a demonstration on the board, which will make, you'll read the slides with me, and you'll go, this makes no sense, and then I'll do it on the board, and it'll suddenly start making sense. All right, so normalization is the topic of the day. Normalization is a topic that a lot of students struggle with because it's very theory heavy in concept. And it's one of those things that you don't get it until you suddenly get it, if that makes sense. Like, you know, sometimes there's certain concepts you go through life, you go, I don't get it, I don't get it. And suddenly you just, the light bulb turns on and you suddenly it hits you. And you go, oh, now I understand. No, that's what normalization is. I'm going to do my best to at least try to turn on a few light bulbs today. All right, I'm going to skip the objectives because they're pointless. Um, oh, the other thing is, if anybody had looked at the slides before Tuesday, you will notice that today's slide deck is significantly abridged. 
um, I had the course lead agree with me that we could drop like 10 slides. There was a concept that's not even being tested that occupied 25% of the slide deck. I said, we're not testing them on this. It's really not important at level one. So can we just not? And the guy went, I agree. I'm like, delete, 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 delete. So it's been updated on Brightspace. My slide deck's still slightly different because I tweaked it after the last group that just had it. Like I got rid of a couple of pointless things in it, uh, but it's all good. The, the, the majority's still there. All right, so the scenario is that we received one or more tables of existing data. The question is, should we, and we want to put it in the database, should we take it as is or should we do something to it and make it better? Normally, we want to do something to it to make it better. That process is called normalization. <clears throat> database normalization is the process used to organize a database into tables and columns. The idea is that a table should be about a specific topic and only the columns that support the topic are included. So when we're trying to design a database, we want to make each table to be about one thing and only one thing. That's why we're saying it's a single topic. So we have, in Access, we have a student table. That student table has information about students and only information about students. It has nothing to do with courses, programs, schedules, lockers, none of that. It only has to do with student information. Names, addresses, phone numbers, that kind of thing. When you limit a table to one purpose, also known as a topic, you reduce the amount of duplicated data, which helps eliminate issues that have to do with database modifications. Uh, we're going to be talking about those for three or four slides today. Uh, they're known as anomalies. Um, to assist in achieving those objectives of avoiding the database modification issues, there's rules that have been developed and they're basically called the normal forms. So why do we want to know what's normalizing? So there's three reasons why we want to normalize data. The first one is to minimize duplicate data. We, we don't want to duplicate data because it's bad. The second one is to avoid or minimize modification issues. And the third one is to simplify queries. By simplifying queries, you don't mean we're going to make the queries shorter. We're just going to make the queries easier to work with. Uh, we'll be talking about complex queries after the break, like starting uh, November. Um, so below we have a table. Um, and we're going to be referring to this table. So for those of you that actually have the slides up, rem keep this slide up as I work through the next couple of slides on the screen. It'll make it easier to follow along what I'm talking about. So we have a table. We have a, an identifier picked out, employee ID. And in here we've got a salesperson, sales office, the office number, and some customers. The primary key in that table is underlined the employee ID. There's a few things to notice that the, ser the table serves many purposes. It actually has several topics inside of it. We identify sales reps or salespeople. We list the sales offices and the phone numbers. We are connecting a, a sales rep with an office and we're also listing the customers to the sales rep. Literally, we have three different topics in one table. Sales reps, offices, and customers. When a table serves many purposes and chooses specific challenges, it duplicates data. There's update issues, and it makes trying to query stuff harder because you end up having to write complex where clauses. You guys, have you guys started learning about conditionals in Java yet? If? Not yet? Okay. Hopefully you get it done before we start taking SQL. Uh, <laughs> but Essentially, when you're trying to make a decision, the more, the less well-designed a table is, the harder it is to actually pick things because you end up having to include more and more. When if the record is like this and like that and like this and like that, then you're going to find it instead of just trying to find the one piece. All right. So we're going to talk about anomalies for a little bit. So we have uh, data duplication and modification anomalies. Duplicated information presents two problems. 
it increases storage and decreases performance. It increases storage because you're duplicating stuff. That means the more copies you have, the more room it takes. It's just like you go and photocopy a piece of paper and you make five copies. You're occupying the space of six sheets of paper at that point, right? You got the original plus five more. It takes up room. It decreases performance. If you got to crawl through tens of thousands of records because there's tons of duplicates, it's going to be slower because it's got to go through tens of thousands of records. And it makes it more difficult to maintain data changes. So in table one, each salesperson and the sales office and the office number were listed. That information is duplicated for each salesperson. You'll notice if you go looking at the slide with a little bit of data on it, Chicago is listed twice. Therefore, we're duplicating information for that office. So if we wanted to move Chicago to another location, to be able to reflect that change, we would have to update multiple entries for that office. Even though it's only one office, we'd have to update in multiple places. That's not good. If you're talking about a really big table, there could be hundreds of rows of data, thousands of rows of data, depending on what kind of data you're looking at. And I'm actually going to switch back to that in a moment. But if John Hunt, the one here in the middle, quits, we're going to lose the fact that we know anything about the New York office and the fact that Dell, HP, and Apple were customers. Because if we delete John, we delete that whole row and we're losing that information. That's known as a deletion anomaly. So when you delete one piece of information, you're losing unrelated stuff with it. So the three types we have is insert, update, and delete, or deletion anomalies. And an insertion anomaly is when we can't create a record until we know the information for the entire row. So we want to add, and the example we've got here is we add a, want to add a new sales office in Atlanta. But because the employee ID is the primary key, we can't add the sales office in Atlanta unless we also add an employee at the same time. Therefore, you end up with a chicken before the egg problem. You can't add an employee without an office. You can't add an office without an employee. Therefore, we have an insertion anomaly where suddenly we have to add both at the same time. Uh, the example I used with the other group was this. There's me and a student. We're standing outside. The student's not allowed to come in unless I'm already in the room. But I can't come into the room unless there's already a student here. So how would we come in at the same time? How would we come in? We'd both have to walk in at the exact same moment. And at that point, we'd establish the fact that we're both being created in this room at the same time. That's an insertion anomaly. The fact that the student wants to come in before me should not be predicated on whether or not I'm in the room. Same thing, I shouldn't be predicated whether or not there's a student in the room to be able to come into the room. So that's what this is. It's basically you're forcing more to be created than really needs to be there. An update anomaly. That one's pretty straightforward. We want to update the office phone number. We have to do it in multiple places. Every time we update, there's always a risk that something's going to go wrong. Today's computers are fast. Some of you might not think your computer is fast. Trust me, it's fast. Compared to computers in the 70s and the 80s, and even the early, the early 90s, your computer is fast. Back in the day, it took a long time to update a lot of records. So therefore, you'd update the first record, find the next one needs to be updated, update the second record, find the next one needs to be updated, computer crashes. For whatever reason, power outage, you know, power supply blows, whatever, while it's trying to do its thing. Suddenly, you've got the database in a situation where some records are updated and some are not. So which one's the truth? You no longer know what the truth is because your update got damaged in the process. That's a risk of an update anomaly, is that we have to update too many things to keep the database up to date. Um, and deletion anomaly we already talked about. If we fire John Hunt, we lose the off New York office. So when you do a deletion anomaly is when you delete one piece of data and you take other things with it for the ride. It's not a good thing. Okay. So we're going to be talking about functional dependencies for a bit. When 
way back in the day when relational databases were first starting being created, they were there was this data scientist, his name was CJ Date. I don't know what the CJ stands for. All his books just say CJ Date. He founded a whole new realm of mathematics. It was known as relational algebra. And one of the textbooks I took when I went through school was the CJ date, date book. They literally called it just the CJ date book. It's like that thick. And half the book is literally math, relational math. How much of that do I remember today? None. I actually don't even remember the classes that it was taking. I'm pretty sure I slept through them. Just, I'm being completely honest. It was really boring. It was a really good bed, bedtime bed book to read. Because I don't think I ever got past the first three pages ever. So I don't know how I passed that course. But that being said, he coined a concept called functional dependencies. And he created an entire notation style for it. So a functional dependency occurs when one or a set of attributes determines the value of a second set of attributes. The first example we have here is a terrible example, but that's fine. Basically, number of boxes determines the cost of the cookies. So, 7 times 5, $35. The 35 is determined by the number of boxes. The, the attribute on the left side of the functional dependency is called the determinant. The functional dependency can be based on equations. So if we went extended price is equal to quantity times price, if we were going to rewrite that as relational syntax, it would be quantity comma unit determines the extended price. Essentially, it's saying everything in the parentheses on the left is a determinant. It determines the value of anything after the arrow. Um, This is a simpler example for you guys. So we have a table. In this table, we have an object color, and we decide that the object color is the determinant. In other words, the object color is what is being used to determine the rest of the values for that row. So the object color determines weight. The object color determines shape. Therefore, we can simplify that to say object color determines weight and shape. So this on the right is a set of attributes being determined by a single attribute on the left. If we went to the previous slide, we have a set of attributes on the left, which are the determinants, which determines the attributes on the right. So you can have a set of attributes to the left or a set of attributes to the right, or you can just have one or a mix of them. It's all good. So if there's a single value, there's no parentheses. If there's more than one value, they're in parentheses. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward concept here. We're just talking about dependencies. Now, when we talk about dependencies, we can have a composite determinant. A composite determinant is a determinant of functional dependency that consists of more than one attribute, like that first example I had. So student number and class number determines the grade. You can't figure out what the grade is unless you know both the student number and the class number, or you could do course number if you wanted. The combination of those two gives you the grade. You cannot get a grade without the two determinants. So the way the functional dependency rules work as follows, there's the decomposition rule. So if A determines B and C, that means A determines B and A also determines C. In other words, Anything to the right of the arrow can be decomposed. In other words, it can be broken down to smaller pieces. Therefore, if A determines B and A determines C, therefore A determines B and C. So you can go backwards and forwards, and that's known as the union rule. So we can take all the dependencies, put it together as a single dependency. Or we can have them as individuals. We can go back and forth as applicable. However, if A and B determines C, that means that neither A nor B determines C by itself because you cannot decompose what's to the left. So when, a when it's a determinant that is a composite, in other words, made up of more than one piece, you cannot decompose the determinant. You can de decompose the dependencies, but not the de determinant. So essentially, the, the rule is that all you need to remember is 
If it's to the right of the arrow, you're allowed to break it down. If it's to the left of the arrow, you're not allowed to break it down. And now we're done talking about relational algebra. <laughs> it's You just need to basically remember, you know, decomposition rule, union rule, and you can't decompose the determinant. Those are the three things you need to remember. So, when are determinants de decided as being unique? A determinant is unique if a relation, if and only if, it determines every other column in the relation. So, when we're talking about um, a table of data and we have our determinants, basically our potential identifiers, it's a determinant when it identifies everything else and nothing else. Um, you can't find the determinants for a functional dependency simply by looking at a single column. You always have to look at the entire set of data you've been given. Sometimes there's a limitation, like they don't give you a lot of records, so you have to do a best guess. Um, and it should usually be what's called a logical determinant. In other words, it should be make sense to be used as a determinant. Like an order ID would be a good determinant for an order, like an order number. Or um, a student number is a good determinant for a student. You know, if you're given a list of data and there's a student number, you, it's probably a safe bet that's a pretty good determinant to work with. So if you're given lots of data, you basically crawl through and you look at each row as a whole and you try to find the combination of the attributes that can be used as a determinant, essentially. I'll be going through an example at the end with all these bits and pieces in place, and it'll make more sense when you see it. All right, so relations are categorized as a no in normal form based on which modification anomalies they are subject to and which ones they're resolving. For this course, we're only going to worry about the first three normal forms. So first, second, and third normal forms. There's one called BCNF, voice cod normal form. In the industry, it's known also as normal form three and a half because it's between the third normal form and the fourth normal form. So it's first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, voice cod, fourth, fifth, DKNF, sixth, seventh, eighth, and onwards. We don't even talk about that. We're only going to worry about one, two, three for this course. Um, honestly, anything past fourth normal form usually falls into what I like to call pocket protector land. Um, it is very rare that you ever need to worry about fifth normal form and whatever. It's usually when there's really weird edge cases and somebody basically had to come up with a reason for their PhD dissertation. So they came up with a new normal form. They said, oh, if we have this weird case, then we have to do this. And they gave it a name and then got a PhD for it. Um, I'm being a bit facetious, but it's not really that far from the truth. The cool thing is, is that most of the time when things are in third normal form, they're often into voice cod, fourth and fifth automatically. Essentially, once you have no longer have any anomalies in your, in your data structure, you're basically covering every normal form, not just the first three. So, yeah. All right. Now, this is what's important when we talk about normalization. And this is going to be important for lab for lab five. Okay, you can ignore the read the business rules carefully. That's if you're given business rules. You're not going to be given any business rules for your exercises. They're not that important for this. You're going to do one step at a time. You're not going to do first to third normal form. Bam, done. You're going to do one, two, then three. But this is the important ones. You do not add data. You do not remove data. You don't add any attributes and you don't take away attributes. You have to work with what you're given. You do not add anything. You do not take anything away. The process should be reversible. In other words, once you've normalized all the way to third normal form, you should be able to reverse it. But if you're, if you're removing data or you're adding data, you won't be able to reverse it because you're creating or taking things away. Therefore, you can't go backwards if things aren't there anymore or if there's more than what was there originally. So you should be able to go first to third, third back to first. Okay, all relations are not equal. 
Some are easy to process, others are problematic. Uh, relations are categorized into normal forms based on the kind of problems they resolve. Um, we're only going to worry about functional dependencies, essentially today. Um, knowledge of these normal forms will help you create appropriate database designs. This is why we try to get this lecture done well before the assignment is due, so that when you guys are doing your database design, you can look at what you've designed and make sure it makes sense. So there's three normal forms that here by most databases, which is true. Um, sometimes we worry about voice cod. It's rare, but you know, it is what it is. Okay. So first normal form, we're gonna do the definitions and then we're gonna do an example. One and F. The information stored in a relational table contains atomic values and there's no repeating groups of columns. Um, a repeating group of columns, hang on, I'm just gonna skip ahead a few slides. Okay, over here, this is not a relation because you have one row here and then you have a repeating group of columns that go with it. So to see this block over here with these empty gaps, all of this belongs together, but here we have a group of columns that's repeating. Therefore, this is not in first normal form because there's a repeating group of columns. Product ID, description, finish, standard price, and quantity is being repeated. Because all of this belongs to this. Therefore, this is all one big block, and this set is being repeated for that one row. So that's what we mean when we say repeated group of columns. Okay, so when we talk about a column ha having an atomic value, it means that there's only a single value in that column. When we have a repeating group of columns, what's happening is we have a single row of, row of data with multiple values at some point because they're repeating. And it has a defined primary key. So to be in first normal form, there's no repeating groups of columns and it has a primary key. That's the definition of first normal form. Second normal form. So relation to the second normal form, if and only if it's already in first normal form, you cannot be in second normal form unless you're already in first normal form. Just like you can't be a super Saiyan unless you're already a Saiyan. It's just how it works. I know that I could do this with Pokemon too, but I don't know them. So my daughter told me which ones to use and I forgot. So, you know, whatever. Um, so it must be in first normal form. And all non-key attributes are determined by the entire primary key. So that's known as a um, partial dependency. We need to get rid of the partial dependencies to be in second normal form. So we have an example. Student ID and activity points to activity fee. In this case, really, activity fee is only determined by activity. It has nothing to do with the student ID. The activity fee is determined by the activity. So it's like, you know, there's five of you lined up. You're all going to pay the same price. You're going to a concert. You're all going to pay the same ticket price at Student Commons, right? Everybody pays the same thing. Your student ID has nothing to do with how much you're going to pay with the event for the event. The event determines the price. Therefore, in this case, the activity fee is determined by the activity, and it has nothing to do with the student ID. Therefore, activity fee is a partial dependency because The, because the activity fee is determined by activity and not the entire primary key, it's known as a partial. And then we get the third normal form. And I'm going to, like, when I do the example in a minute, it'll make way more sense. So a relation is in third normal form if and only if it is in second normal form. You're seeing a pattern here, right? You can't be in second unless you're in first. You can't be in third unless you're in second. Just like when you play baseball, you can't run to third base. You got to go first base, second base, third base. And there are no non-key attributes determined by another non-key attribute. I'll be, when I do the example, I'll really <laughs> point this out. But here we have an example. The student housing table 
has student ID, building, and building fee. So the student ID determines what building they're in. The building fee is determined by the building. Therefore, the building fee transits through the building, so student ID to building, building to building fee, because the building fee is not part of the identity the candidate key, or it's not a determinant, it's a transit. I'll be using that, that, that blue screen I had up in a minute. That's what I'll be using for the example. So and then we have BCNF. Voice COD has to do with um, if a relation or a table has more than one candidate key, there could be issues. Um, basically put, when a relation's in voice COD is when all the attributes depend on the key and nothing but the key. So you've identified the primary key. There are no other identifiers. And the attribute depends on that. That's the definition of voice COD. And voice COD's not always desirable. Sometimes you'll actually choose to not go to voice COD, which is why it's sort of like between three and four, because you don't always need it. For example, zip code's a good one. A lot of people, you could take the zip codes because it's a repeated set of values, right? You, theoretically, or postal codes, you could have a bunch of people living at the same postal code. So in theory, you could take the postal code, put it in its own table with its own identifier. But realistically, what's the point? You'd actually just make things slower because you have to look up multiple tables to pull out a single row of data. When you start learning about joins next semester, you'll see why you don't want to do that. It's just overkill. Um, all right, so now I'm going to talk about the example. So this is not a relation because although we do have a primary key identified, this slide actually has a mistake. The primary keys shouldn't be underlined. Whoever put this, this is this is actually interesting because at this example here, as I was telling the other group before you. What's from a textbook we used to use in this course years ago? And it was the same textbook I used in my database design course when I went through school. It's the exact same example from 1995. That's how much it hasn't changed. Like this has not changed since the 70s. Like the concept has been established and done. It is not being changed. So once you learn this, you don't need to worry about learning a new flavor of it. Like, you know, oh, I took uh, Java 11. Oh, shoot, they came out with Java 14 and everything changed. Or actually C Sharp would be a better example of that. Where, you know, C Sharp from 2003 is very different from C Sharp nowadays. Normalization has not changed. So I'm very familiar with this example. I've been using it for 15 years in this course. And then I, I remember the first time I opened up the textbook, I'm going, shit, they haven't even changed it. So it's good. So this is not a proper relation. And yeah, they had that mistake with the underlines in the original textbook in the 90s. So they haven't even bothered to fix that. So this is not a proper relation because we have a repeating group of columns and let's pretend there's no primary key. So how do we fix it? The way to fix this is stupid easy. To turn this into first normal form, we do that. We just basically filled in the missing block with what was above it. So now we have a complete row. We have our primary key that's been identified. So order ID plus product ID allows us to identify any given row in that table. Customer ID is not involved. That's important for this example. Because 1006 plus five tells us the writer's desk. 1007 plus 11 tells us it's a four dresser drawer. We can identify each row completely. So each value is atomic. In other words, the intersection of a single column and a single row only ever has one value in it. It could be multiple words, but it's only one value. So dining table, cherry, uh, 1025, 2015, that kind of thing. Um, actually, I should say they did change one thing on this example from when I went to school. They changed the dates. That's all they did. Because that used to say like, uh, like something like 1989 or something originally, but that's the only thing that they changed. So that's how you fix it. Now it is a it is a relation, but it's not a well structured one because it suffers from all three anomalies. So 
let's start with an update anomaly. We want to change the price of the entertainment center from 650 to 700. The problem is if we want to change it, we need to do it in two places. Even though it's the same entertainment center design, it should be the same, only one entry for it. We have to do it multiple places. That's an update anomaly. Insert anomaly. We can't add a new kind of furniture without creating an order for it in this structure. Therefore, the insertion and anomaly is we need to create more data than really is what is needed. Deletion anomaly. Uh, value furniture decides that they don't want to have the writer's desk. So we delete that row and we discover that we no longer know anything about writer's desk or the color cherry. That's a deletion anomaly. When we delete one piece of information and we lose unrelated data. The fact that value furniture doesn't want that desk anymore doesn't mean that we should lose track of the fact that we ever sold a desk. But that's what's going to happen. Because if we delete that row, we lose the whole thing. Okay. Now you guys get to enjoy my horrible handwriting. Everything else is happening here. Using that example. Okay, so we have order ID. I'm going to shorten the field names because I don't have that much whiteboard space. C ID, C name, C address, product ID, P description, P finish, P price, hang on, P price, and quantity. Okay, and According to that, the product ID and the order ID is our primary key. So we are currently in first normal form. So before we continue to go down to second normal form, we need to do two things. One, we're going to find our full dependencies because the goal of normalization is we want every attribute to be fully dependent on the determinants, also known as the prime, the, the candidate keys or the primary keys. So the very first thing we're going to go, we're going to look at this and go, hmm, do we have any full dependencies that we don't need to worry about going forward? Now, when we look at it, we can see that the order date, the customer, the name, and the address have nothing to do with the product. Really, it's only determined by the order ID. So these are partial dependencies. That's not fully dependent. The description, finish, and price is probably dependent on the product, but now we have the quantity. The quantity is not dependent on just the, the product ID or the order ID. It's actually dependent on both. Therefore, we know that quantity is fully dependent on the entire primary key. So we have a one full dependency. But now we have a bunch of other columns that we haven't addressed yet. So we know by process of elimination that the order date, customer ID, customer name, and the address is currently only dependent on, that was a bad arrow, on the order. So this is a partial dependency because this has nothing to do with the product information at all. Because when we roll down and we look at it over here, you'll notice that the customer information is being repeated for every order ID, but the product ID changes, but the customer information is not changing. Therefore, that's only dependent on that key. Over here, we know that the price, the finish, and the description is dependent on the product ID like such. So now we have two partial dependencies, two partial functional dependencies. And the way we fix this is we take these partials and we blow them out into their own entities. Yeah. Because these attributes are only dependent on a part of the primary key. 
Yes. Right? So we have a composite primary key. Therefore, these columns are dependent only on this. Now, we're going to ignore the fact that about the customer ID and the name and stuff like that, because that customer ID isn't part of the primary key. So we're not going to worry about that for now. It is a problem, but we're going to worry about it for the next step. So we have a full dependency and two partials. So what we want to do next is we want to drop and go to um, anything that's partial will be blown out into its own entity. So we're going to start with order. Okay, so order has order ID, order date, customer ID, customer name, customer address. Primary key. We have a product, so we're going to go product, which has a product ID, product description, product finish, product price. And again, we have our primary key. And then we have our order line. which is our green up here. That means we need, that's not a Q, that's an O. ID, product, ID, and quantity. Okay. <laughs> so now we're officially in second normal form. We can say we're in 2NF, because we don't have any partial dependencies anymore. We are in first NF, and we no longer have any partial dependencies, therefore we're in 2NF. One of the cool things about when you start normalizing is sometimes when you do second normal form, you accidentally make things third normal form also. For example, quantity is dependent on the entire key. So if I were to draw my little green arrows again, just for, for your guys' enjoyment. Quantity is determined by order ID and product ID. It's fully dependent on the key and nothing but the key, and there's nothing else in that table. So we can honestly say that this is in 3NF because there's no other anomalies in it. There's no more issues. Same deal here. We can go... Price finish description depends on the product ID. That one's also in 3NF. Cool. This one, on the other hand, has a problem. It's an, yeah, an intersection slash associate of table. It's exactly what it is. That's what this is becoming. It's not a table yet. It's a relation. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. So we do have one issue left at this point in time. The issue we have is the customer name and the customer address is determined by the customer ID, but the customer ID is not part of the primary key. Order ID is the primary key, but customer ID is not. So now what we have here is known as a transitive dependency. A transitive dependency occurs when an attribute is determined by another attribute that is not primary key. So customer name is determined by customer ID. Customer ID is now determined by order ID. Because it's not part of the primary key, so it's being determined by the primary key. Because it's not part of the primary key, it's not a determinant. But a transitive dependency is when one attribute is determined by another attribute that is not a determinant. Therefore, this took me a couple of years before I actually realized why it was called a transitive dependency. It's because 
to reach the name, you have to transit through another attribute. So you go primary key to attribute, attribute to another attribute. So you're transiting from the primary key through one attribute to get to another one. So it's transitive. I had a student say that to me. I'm like, damn, that's a really good explanation. Sometimes students come up with the best ex ex explanations. So what we have here is a transitive dependency. So here's how it works. The address, the name, is determined by the customer ID. And the customer ID and the order date is determined by the order ID. So if we draw our arrows, suddenly you'll realize that the green doesn't go all the way to the end. This is its own thing all of a sudden. How do you fix a transitive dependency? You break it out to its own thing. So basically that's the point. You decompose it until you can't decompose it anymore. Well, you'll see once I'm done. But essentially, the the process of normalization is decomposing relations until you can't decompose them anymore. They cannot be broken down anymore. So when you guys go to do Lab 5, this is what Lab 5 is about. We expect you to do exactly what I'm doing. Without, you don't need the arrows, by the way. I'm putting the arrows in so you guys can visualize what I'm talking about. Normally, you don't include the arrows. If you want to put them in, knock yourself out, but you don't need them. Okay, so now we're going to go do 3 and F. So we're going to start with um, customer, which has the customer ID, the customer name, and the customer address. We are going to have the order. We have the order ID, the order date, and the customer ID. We have the product, which has not changed. So we have the product ID, the product description, the product finish, and the product price. And the last one has the order line. which is um, order ID. That one has changed either. Order ID, ID, and quantity. So now this is in 3NF. This is in proper 3NF. We are able to add a customer without affecting anything else. We can change a customer's address without affecting anything else. In theory, we could delete a customer potentially without affecting anything else. We create a new order. Great. We can modify a product, change the description, adjust the price without modifying anything else. If a customer decides they want to have more of something, we only need to update one line. If they decide they don't want it, we just need to delete this. And all it does, it deletes the intersection record. We don't lose the product. We don't lose the customer. We don't lose the order. Each of these items is self-contained. Now, the only other thing I'm going to put on here, which normally you don't do, but I'm going to put it in here so you guys can visualize what just happened. CID, customer ID. What I underlined in green is basically foreign keys. Normally, you don't indicate the foreign keys when you're normalizing. But right now, I'm just pointing to showing you guys how we went from this one relation slash entity to four, completely broken down. You can see where the foreign keys are. So you can see where things are coming in. So this is a compound primary key. That's also a foreign key. That's just a foreign key. Yay. It's got its own primary key. And it's completely self-contained. There are no more any, there's, 
There's no transitive dependencies. There's no partial dependencies. There's no multi-valued attributes. It's in proper third normal form. That's the goal of normalization from one side to the other. Any questions about the example? Like I said earlier, some t I used to do two examples back to back, and then I realized after a couple times of doing that, that that second example is not going to go in anybody's head tonight. You have too much to digest. So, the process of normalization should be reversible. In theory, I could take this, and if I took all of this, slapped it all back together, and we just got rid of the duplicates, like CID being in two places and order ID and product ID being in two places, I could just put it all back to that because I didn't lose any data. I didn't add any data. And at this point, there's, it's free from in, insert, update, and delete anomalies. No, because the data is already there. We're reusing it, but we're not adding anything any new, anything new, and we're not taking anything away. So when you're done here, you should not have anything here that wasn't here at some point. And you should have everything that was here somewhere over here. If you're missing something from here, you done fucked up. It can be reused in multiple entities if it makes sense because there's relationships on how things are determined. Okay. That was the last slide. And I'm right on schedule with how much painful this was. No, I know it is. Um, so next week, I'm going to do another example of this. I am also going to um, quickly go over the midterm as in, you know, roughly the breakdown of topics. What you guys should be working on is I'll be releasing Lab 5 this weekend. Hopefully I don't forget this time. Apparently I forgot. Lab 4 for some groups. So Lab 5 will be released. You guys get to work on this next week. Um, hybrid 2 is coming up shortly. And obviously the assignment's coming up. So that's the situation, folks. Outside of that, we're pretty much done for the day. <laughs>